Happy Sunday morning to you. Thanks for joining us again today. Uh, our world changed a little bit again this past week as we heard about new directives, etc. I just want to encourage you this morning to remember that God is in control. As we gather together for worship, what will God do during this time? I want to just share a passage with you from Colossians 3. Uh, if you saw the devotion this week, you know I've been reading through Colossians and it just stays there. So Colossians 3 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, in memory of Easter Sunday last week, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. In the midst of all the chaos and uncertainty, Christ is at the throne. God is in control. Let's worship him together this morning. There are a few things I just want to say to encourage you this morning as we get going. Uh, the first is thank you. Thanks for those of you that have been in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to stay connected. So send us those pictures of your family. We miss you. Uh, we'd love to see what's going on in your life. Help us to stay connected that way. Secondly, uh, thanks for those who have been continuing to give. It's been such a blessing to see uh, the, the checks and, and tithes come in through the mail. Uh, many are giving online. Thank you from the, from the church. We are functioning well. Can, we ask that you just would continue to think of us and that we would continue to serve the Lord together. Let's uh, sing together through song. Two, three, four. Sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every 
We want you to know that uh, we were tremendously encouraged and excited last week of how many people participated in our, our prayer focus and uh, even for the, the Tuesday fasting and praying. And, and we do encourage you to continue to pray. The uh, EFCA National Office is encouraging um, folks to take Wednesday specifically as a day to remember, to focus on prayer. And so we want to encourage you to do that. But we also want to take time right now and uh, just pray together. And, and so we're going to uh, uh, list out four different areas to, to be specific and pray for, and then give you a moment uh, to pray for that, however God may lay that on your heart. We're first going to uh, encourage you to pray just for healing. Uh, the scripture we used last week out of Second Chronicles chapter 7 talked about uh, us humbling ourselves before God and, and asking him to heal our land. And so I'm going to just encourage you to, to pray for God's healing through this virus. There may be folks that you specifically know who could use your prayers. And so let's just take a moment uh, to pray for God's healing at this time. The next focus that we're going to have is on perseverance. It's an unknown, right? How long this, whatever this is, is going to keep going on. We'll need to persevere. The, in James, it tells us that we should consider it joy, joy in the midst of suffering. How can you persevere through this? Let's spend a, a few moments in prayer asking for God's help as we persevere. Another area that we encourage you to pray for is wisdom. And that may be something that, that uh, we don't think about praying for, but Scripture is very clear that uh, out of Proverbs that we are to, to uh, seek wisdom um, as a precious jewel. And, and James tells us uh, uh, to ask God for wisdom, and he will give it to us. And, and then he talks about in chapter 3 of James of how that wisdom changes how we view things. And so we're going to encourage you just to pray uh, for godly wisdom through this time of how you continue in your own life, the wisdom that God gives you of what you need, but also uh, for the wisdom for leaders as they also uh, uh, seek ways to uh, help us get through this time. And so truly uh, pray for God's wisdom at this time.
And finally, let's pray for the church, our church here at Faith Church in, in Woodruff, but also the EFCA, uh, even bigger, the worldwide church, as we go through this together. How can we, the church, make an influence in our community? How can we uh, continue to hold together through this in unity as we are united in Christ? Two, three, four. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met. Pastor Randy already said, uh, we do miss you. We would uh, love to, to be with you. 
Um, and one of the things we do every now and then is, is greet one another. And so uh, we'll start off with that right now. Uh, greet those next to you and uh, let them know that you are glad that you are with them. Now, if you're by yourself and you just greeted someone, we may need to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, truly are thankful that you're here. And uh, I'm just going to ask you to pray with me right now. Father, I ask you to lead, move, direct. May your word, your truth be real and evident and truly uh, life-changing for us this morning. Thank you for who you are, what you're done, what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing on in uh, the Gospel of John, a series that we've entitled Believe and Live. But we're actually coming back to where we were four weeks ago in John chapter 11. If you've been with us the last three weeks, we kind of uh, moved ahead into John chapter 18 through 20 to kind of set up the Easter season and, and what that looked like. And, and so we're, we're coming back to John chapter 11, and it kind of feels like for those who remember the movie Groundhog Day, a, a Groundhog Day moment. Uh, if you're not familiar with that movie, it's a 1993 comedy that uh, Bill Murray was the lead character in that, and he was a cynical TV weatherman, and, and he finds himself reliving the same day over and over and over every day that he wakes up, and uh, he goes on location uh, to Pennsylvania where the groundhog is supposed to come and see his shadow and uh, um, the, the movie just shows him uh, coming back to the same day, waking up in the same place day after day. And there's a quote in that movie that by his character Phil says, this is one time where television really fails to capture the true excitement of a large squirrel predicting the weather. Now, that uh, is true in that, that show, but uh, what I make reference to is that Easter, what we just celebrated on Easter Sunday, um, is, is a day to capture an event that should be lived out day in and day out in God's people that what took place not only on Easter but on Good Friday in the life of Christ it is not a, a four-hour television show, the greatest story ever told, which is a good movie, but the life of Christ is something that we should be living out. The gospel is something we should be living out day after day after day. And we see that throughout Scripture God working in people's life, pointing them to the cross and to his resurrection. And today God continues to work in our lives and his people living out, desiring for us to live out the gospel and, and truly impacting how we live. And, and so I want to ask you, how can Jesus and the victory we have through Resurrection Sunday not impact our lives? How can that not change how we live and how we deal with whatever we're going through today? Today's message is actually entitled, Haters Are Going to Hate. Now, this may not be a phrase or a slang that you're familiar with, and it simply implies that criticism says more about the critic or the hater than the person being criticized. It, haters are going to hate means that people who don't like you will always find a reason to dislike you, no matter how senseless that reason may be. We're actually going to see that in John chapter 11, that we're picking up at verse 45, and, and uh, we looked at the first part of John chapter 11 that was seen as probably or was his greatest miracle, the, 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 the raising of Lazarus. 
uh, we're going to kind of break down chapter uh, 11, verse 45 to the end, and then pick it up also in chapter 11. But uh, verse 45 in John 11 says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Now, again, it's important to understand what just took place, and you can go back and look at the beginning of John chapter 11, or you can go back and look at the sermon uh, from a few weeks back. But Jesus just did the miracle of all miracles. He brought the dead back to life. We see that, that Jesus had this personal relationship with Mary, Mary and Martha, and Lazarus. They were his friends. And we see there in that scripture, the shortest verse in the Bible where it says, Jesus cried. When he had heard, when he knew that Lazarus was dead and that how it impacted his sisters, Mary and Martha, it impacted Jesus and showed how much he cares about us. How much of relationship is, is a two-way street. It's not just our relationship with God, but God's relationship with us. And this was, we know, his, his final public miracle. And it was a biggie. We also see in verse 25 where Jesus said these impactful words. Jesus said to Mary, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks his question, do you believe this? And we know, we see from that scripture that many did believe in Jesus, that he is who he said he was, and, and yet others were still doubting. We see in verse 37, it says, but some of them said, uh, could not he who opened the eye of the blind man keep this man from dying? They continue to doubt. We see haters are going to hate. You see, it didn't matter what Jesus did, and including raising someone from the dead. There's some folks who are just not going to believe. Jesus does raise Lazarus, and many, it says, who saw that believed in him. And you think about that. How could you not? How could you not believe he is God? And yet still others didn't. Verse 46 says, Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. We see the first tattletales, if you will. Some of those who, who were with Mary probably had a relationship or friendship with Mary and Martha still not only did not believe, but went to the religious leaders to to tell on Jesus. These are the same people who saw the same thing. Others saw this miracle and believed and others didn't. And it's important to understand, it's not miracles that cause us to believe. It's faith. Some people, and maybe even you, have said this, if only God would show me, if God just did this, I would believe. It's not the miracles. It's trusting in him. It's believing and living. The Apostle Paul says, we live by faith, not by sight. So let me ask you, how can we know if someone is saved? If someone truly is a believer? Now, the easy answer to that, and it is a, a good answer, is only God knows, ultimately. Jesus says in, in Matthew, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There are some who believe that they are believers, and Jesus says, I don't know you. It's not that we can't be confident that we can't know. John makes it very clear that we can know we are saved in 1 John chapter 5. But understand that if God is who he says he is, and he is, God is holy, God is pure, God is perfect, 
and that God now lives in us, shouldn't there be something different about us? Shouldn't our lives be changed? Shouldn't our attitudes reflect who Christ is in us? You see, it's not about what we do, but what he did and who he is. We know that he died to give us life. And he says to give us life in its fullest. And that's what we are called to believe. We see in these next few verses that God does only what God himself can do. God had a plan. God has a purpose. And that purpose is fulfilled in Jesus Christ for this specific day. Verse 47 in John 11 says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? Interesting question from them. They asked, There is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. He did not say this on his own, but as a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness in a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. My friends, this scripture here is, is one of those potentially a, a head scratcher, but it's also one of those, wow, one of those aha moments. You see, the, the days and literally the week before Jesus died on the cross, this was part of God's sovereign plan. We see here Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, they're, they're scheming to plot they, they've already been talking. That's why they, they ask that, that question, what are we accomplishing? What are we going to do here? They were, they're scheming and plotting, calculating this devious plan, looking to get rid of what they thought was the problem, Jesus himself. And they never realized that they were just a small part of the greater work of this great and sovereign God, and his plan, and his purpose. You see, it, it was Caiaphas, uh, the chief priest, who, who came up in his mind, he thought of this master plan, without really knowing that he was declaring what needed to happen with Jesus and the nation of Israel. They would make Jesus out to be this revolutionary leader, this troublemaker, and suggest that that. that to the Romans, that if he were executed, all their problems would now come to an end. He was suggesting that Jesus die so that the nation of Israel would not be destroyed. They were going to use Jesus' death as a substitute for all the people. Think about that. You get the connection here? They were falling right in line with what God knew was what all people needed, was a substitute to die for their sins. It's truly hard to believe that these leaders actually thought they were saving the people by offering Jesus to die in their place. You see, God knew all of their sinful actions were fitting right into his eternal plan. And then we move into John chapter 12. And this is actually the end of Jesus' public ministry. John chapter 12, the first nine verses. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. 
Here a dinner was given in G Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took out a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's a, worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. We know that this anointing of Jesus is in preparation for the coming sacrifice, for his ultimate triumphal entry on that, that Palm Sunday and the preparation and prediction of his death. Now we know if we went back to, to John chapter 1 and he opens this gospel and he says, says uh, he has come into the world and his own people received him not. We see that come to fruition here. The, the first 12 chapters of John, John uh, lays out and presents one proof after another, providing undeniable evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is who he claimed to be. And now John chapter 12 begins six days before Passover. Jesus left Ephraim, returns to Bethany where Lazarus lived, and, and they have this dinner for him. He, he's the, the honored guest. They invite his disciples and, and, and a few other friends, which according to Mark was actually at the place of the home of Simon the leper in Mark 14, it says that. This is a dinner with close friends. It's celebrating the life of Lazarus but also preparing for the death of Christ. What we see here is this powerful testimony of God using the gifts of his people to serve and worship him. We see here specifically Mary and Martha having a dinner. Now, some of us might recall back in Luke chapter 10 where this same scenario was happening where where Martha was scurrying around trying to prepare this meal, and she actually gets upset because Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, just worshiping, learning, taking him in. And at that time, Jesus reprimands Martha. But we see here there's a different scenario in that Martha's attitude is different. Martha, who probably is a type two, if you understand the Enneagram, someone who who loves serving others, who wants to be a helper. You see, Jesus wants us to use where our gifts are, to use who he created us to be, but to use them in a way that honors him and worships him. The difference between those two dinners was her attitude is a defining factor. She now wants to serve and use it as an act of worship in serving. Mary's gift is this gift of generosity. She, she always wants to give and to worship and honor Christ. And we see this in a powerful way as this act of pure love with this perfume. We understand that it's a, a year wages. Some say that it is approximately $10,000. But I think what is most noted here, it was her most valued possession. Her act of worship brought a fragrance to the entire house in which they were dining. It was a blessing of her gift that not only at that time, but ultimately spread around the world. In Matthew 26, verse 13, it says, Truly I say to you, Wherever the go this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken 
in memory of her. What everyone at the table saw and experienced was an act of love. Everyone except for one person. Judas saw it as an extravagant waste. Haters are going to hate. Judas also was given a gift, but he turned that into greed. Mary was selfless and, and a giving follower. Judas was a selfish, greedy, self-serving pretender. You see, when we're using our gifts as an act of worship, God is glorified and the gospel is being revealed and lived out time and time again through us. In chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also because of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Notice people came they heard about Lazarus being risen from the dead. They came to see Lazarus. And so the chief priests not only wanted to kill Jesus, but they wanted to kill Lazarus as well. That's interesting that there are no words spoken in Scripture or, or written in Scripture that Lazarus spoke. But his miraculous life was an effective witness of who Christ was in his life and what Christ had done for him. The fact that Lazarus was a walking miracle put him into a place of danger. It's important to understand that God never promised to make our life easy or to give me what I want. That's not God's agenda. That's not the gospel being lived out. God wants to imprint his glory into our life to help us to become children who would bear his image in a fallen world. If we are to trust in him based only on our circumstances, then our faith, our, that trust will change, as James says, like the waves in the sea that are blown and tossed by the wind. Living out the gospel is trusting God's love for you each and every day in every circumstance because you are confident that God knows who you are and he cares more deeply about you than you do yourself. And he, God, is capable of working out his glory in and through you no matter what's going on in our life. We see that with his friends. Here at this, this quiet evening of having a dinner together, this truly must have brought a special encouragement and strength to Jesus' heart as he knew he was going to face what this final week was going to endure. My friends, we have an opportunity each and every day to have a Groundhog Day experience, to relive each and every day as a Christ follower, that Christ now lives in us. Our lives have been changed because he is now alive. That's the only way our lives can be accounted for is the power of Christ, the power of the resurrection, the power of the gospel being lived out. Whatever the circumstances are in your life right now, those should not be cannot be the determining factor of how we live our life, of how we plan what tomorrow holds. Because we know, as Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good, here's the key, of those who love God, those who are being called according to his purpose. God is in control. Things will work out. If we have believed that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then we, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, can have a great defense 
and witness to the gospel. We are unanswerable proofs of the reality that Jesus Christ is alive and he lives in us. You see, God is asking for us to forfeit our own agenda and embrace his, to live out that Easter morning. The victory that we have in Christ is ours and we are empowered by that to live each and every day. You see, Easter Sunday is not about whether or not we go to heaven or hell, but whether we want to believe and live in Christ or continue to trust in ourselves. Jesus Christ is alive, and he will make a difference as he lives in and through us. Galatians 2.20 says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Why? Because we are crucified. We have died to ourself, and he is now alive. Pray with me. Father, I do pray that uh, we truly would understand the life we have in Christ and that you will be glorified through all we do. We thank you for that life. We thank you for the victory. And I pray, Father, you would overwhelm, you would comfort and give peace and hope to each and every person who puts their trust and faith in you. We love you. In Jesus' precious, most holy name we do pray. Amen. I want to close with these uh, encouraging words out of Numbers 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.